Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Clean Energy View Radio Show. Our podcasts are available on iTunes, Zoom, and you can also visit our website at www.cleanenergyview.com. If you have any questions for our guests, there are many ways you can contact the show. You can post a question on our wall on Facebook, Skype us, or contact me directly at June Stoyer on Twitter. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at info at cleanenergyview.com. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming back to the show a man who is not only one of the most innovative and brilliant minds in the global world of energy, but a true New York-style living legend, Mr. Bob Cattell. We're going to talk about a book that he co-authored called The CEO and the Monk, One Company's Journey to Profit and Purpose. Whether you love New York's history or hunger for stories of inspiration, motivation, and true leadership, this is one book that you will really enjoy. So I would like to welcome back to the show, Mr. Bob Cattell. Good afternoon, Mr. Cattell. Hi, June. Good to be back. Mr. Cattell, can you tell our audience about your upbringing? When I read the book, I was just amazed and intrigued at the fact that your upbringing really was a major factor in how you evolved throughout your career and also your ability to select quality key people that have worked with you throughout the years. Well, thank you, June. Uh, as uh, you probably saw in the book, I was uh, born in Brooklyn. Uh, and that gave me a good start right off the bat in the time that I was born in Brooklyn, which was kind of the center of the world in New York City in those days, the Brooklyn Dodges and, and Coney Island and things of that nature. And uh, I was raised by a single parent, my mother. And uh, my mother, I think, uh, I know, had a tremendous impact on me. Uh, she was a woman that uh, didn't have a lot of education, but she was very street smart. And uh, she taught me, June, the, the importance of respect for people, no matter what race, creed, religion, um, that people were people and that you had to respect them no matter where, where they were and uh, to treat them with respect and and she also taught me the values uh you know of of doing the right thing i guess is really kind of basic so i had a very fortunate upbringing my mother growing up in brooklyn in those days you uh, spent a lot of time out on the streets playing with your friends and i guess you developed a certain amount of street smartness if that's the right word but i think it was my mother's basic upbringing that taught me about the importance of doing the right thing and having respect for people and to treat all people with respect I think the fact that your mom was a very strong woman, but she also was politically correct, so to speak, before being politically correct even came into fashion, was also very important. For example, when people think of Brooklyn Union, or when it was first known as Brooklyn Union, yes, it wasn't just your average company. Can you explain to our audience, especially for folks that live across the pond and in remote corners of the earth that are tuning in today, can you explain to them what Brooklyn was like and why people from the community worked and looked forward to working for the company? Well, Brooklyn, as I mentioned in those days, and, and if you think about Brooklyn, it's a, it's one of the five boroughs of New York City. It's the largest from the standpoint of population, has about two and a half million people still residing in Brooklyn. So it's one of the largest boroughs, but it's also, if it was a city, it would be one of the largest cities in the country. And it's always been a, a borough uh, of neighborhoods, uh, and it's always been a borough of, uh, I would characterize it, diversity, where you had many different uh, types of people growing up in the borough. So it was just sort of the foundation of Brooklyn was neighborhoods and diversity. And the utility company, Brooklyn Union, and, and Brooklyn Union in those days was a, essentially a gas distribution company. We didn't didn't do any electric. Um, being a public utility, it was felt to be very important to some support the community that supported us. Uh, it was not, uh, I don't think, uh, rocket science. It was just, I think, uh, good corporate uh, responsibility that uh, if there was a community that uh, that supported you and utilities and only as good as the customer support they have, it was important to give back. So Brooklyn Union developed a number of programs to support the community. 
and one of the ones that uh, was, I think, very instrumental because Brooklyn in the uh, oh, early, late 60s, early 70s was having some difficulty. So one of the programs that the company came up was called the Cinderella Program, mm -hmm. and it really focused on the great building stock that was in Brooklyn, a lot of brownstone homes that were kind of in disrepair, but by spending a little money, not a lot, that these buildings could be refurbished, can really look great, and the neighborhoods could take pride. And that was one of, I think, the most important programs. That program was, was then uh, copied throughout the country, and I think it had a lot to do with the rebirth of Brooklyn. So it ties together, in my mind, the neighborhood aspect, the corporate responsibility aspect of a good utility, and also economic development, all of which are good things for, for any community. And you also implemented another program called the On the Track program, which was very effective, and it also was beneficial to the company's ability to generate profit. Can you explain what the program consisted of and why it allowed the company to avoid as much loss as it normally would have incurred had it just continued to send out bill collectors, so to speak, instead of offering <laughs> aid instead of the threat? Well, yeah, the On the Track program, again, was, was a program to design to help our customers for the most part. Utility bills can be a burden on people, and when you're in tough economic times, people's ability to pay their bills becomes more difficult. So the philosophy here was that to the extent that we could be helpful and give people advice and counsel on how to manage their finances, how to pay all of their bills, not only their utility bill, that that was a good thing. I mean... One thing you don't want to do is to turn customers off. So that's counterproductive, obviously, from the standpoint of the company and obviously not good for the customer. Uh, so this was a program, again, to try to help people uh, really get on track, if you want to, want to characterize it that way, and be able to manage their finances, pay all of their bills, including their utility bill. And uh, it allowed the company to continue to, to grow and, and add revenues uh, and make profit. There is an important aspect of a public company uh, to make profit for your shareholders. And I think if you can do that in a customer-sensitive way, in a people-sensitive way, it's a win-win situation for both. Thank you. I think that when a company takes that direction and decides that, okay, well, we're going to try to work with our customers because I think it's there's an old saying that it's easier to work with the existing customer and make that customer happy than to go out and get a new one. And even with issues regarding payments, I thought that that was such a brilliant strategy that really did help keep the company's profitability increasing, or to increase, rather. Another question that I have for you is, in regards to the corporate environment, what was it like initially when you came to Brooklyn Union Gas? I mean, you left AT&T, and yeah. that was a big decision. You, you basically had a job with one of the largest corporations in the world, and you decided to leave. Why? So, that's true. Well, the, the reason, I think, goes to the comment you made about it being one of the largest corporations in the world. It was a, a fine company, and, and but it had at that time, I don't know the exact number, but it probably it had at least three or 400,000 employees uh, throughout the country. That was before the breakup of some of the telecommunication companies. So AT&T, or some people refer to it as Ma Bell, uh, really had a uh, monopoly in all of those areas. And coming out of City College, where I was fortunate to get a, a great public education, I studied engineering, uh, I, I just felt that in a company that large, it would be hard for somebody like me to, to really have an opportunity to show you know, what I could do. So I looked around and found that there was a relatively small gas company, as we called it in those days in Brooklyn, called Brooklyn Union. It had about 3,000 employees. It was looking to add some employees. So I reached out and uh, uh, was interviewed for a job, which I finally got. So it gave me the ability to go to a smaller company where I felt my efforts, my work could be recognized and there would be more chance for advancement for me in the future. As it turned out, it, it worked out pretty good for me. <laughs> Very true. In regards to the leadership that you've demonstrated, when you first began working for Brooklyn Union Gas, and you were first out of college, you worked in the meter repair shop and then moved into different positions within the company. 
the fact that you were so hands-on and worked in the company in so many different positions, how do you feel that that lent itself to your ability to really direct the entire company and take it through the necessary transitional stages that it needed to go through? Well, I think, as, as you mentioned, my first job was in the meter repair facility. Not a very glamorous job for a mm. you know, college graduate out of school. But an but, important one. But a very important one. I mean, the, 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 the meter work is obviously critical to utility in, in uh, giving people accurate meter readings and collecting bills. But it was a, it was a uh, um, you know, a, 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 I guess a, a hard work environment is the best way to characterize it. These were really great people working very hard, uh, predominantly union employees. So it gave me also an opportunity to understand uh, the union manager relationship, which becomes very important, obviously, as you get higher up in the company. Uh, uh, there was a really tremendous uh, uh, union leader. Uh, uh, his name was Peter Derwin. He's unfortunately passed away. And uh, there was also a very, very sharp uh, uh, superintendent who was management. His name was Angus McNaughton, Scotsman, great, great mm -hmm. guy. And I watched the interaction between the two of them, and I got to learn a lot about the management union relationship, which helps me in later years. And then, as you say, I was fortunate enough to have an opportunity to move into a number of different positions in the company. I've probably spent some time in my career in almost every area of the company. So I really got to understand the workings, the inner workings uh, of the company and how the pieces fit together between in the, the construction area in, in what we call the distribution department, the billing, the regulatory, the marketing. So as you get higher up in the company, having a good understanding and, and having the ability to relate with people that worked in those areas, I think it helped you in your decision making and it really you know kind of added also to your credibility when you were talking to people from different areas because they knew you worked there they knew you understood the mm -hmm. challenges and opportunities so it was a great education for me uh, to work in many many areas of the company until i eventually obviously rose up in the management ranks and i think that was also a very important position because it really helped you to learn how to just manage the relationships between management and the union workers, which is not an easy task at all. No, it isn't. There's always a, you know, sort of a, uh, I'll call it a respectful tension between the, the two groups. There's a need to treat the union people fairly because they work very hard and deserve to be treated fairly. On the management side, there's uh, the ability, obviously, or the obligation to, to be profitable. So you have to achieve a balance. You have to be fair. Uh, and that again, was part of my, my philosophy is being fair. Uh, there's enough opportunity for both management and union, I think, in any company. Uh, and if you're fair and you treat people fairly, doesn't mean you don't have some, you know, call them tough negotiations along the way to reach a fair compromise, but it can be done. And it gave me respect for the union people and the job that they did. So I was able to, I think, be perhaps a little more sensitive to their needs while keeping in mind the need for the company to be profitable. As you continue to work with Brooklyn Union Gas, there were many transitions. And just as telecom became deregulated, so was the energy industry. And deregulation is not necessarily what people think. How did deregulation impact the company? Well, as you mentioned, uh, the telecommunications company was, was ahead of the energy industry in, in deregulation, and there there are some different aspects to each of those businesses. But utilities, primarily in the energy space, uh, were essentially regulated monopolies. They had a, a territory, a franchise, if you will, that they served the customers in. And in the early days of Brooklyn Union, or up until the later days in Brooklyn Union, if you wanted to buy natural gas, if you lived in Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island, which were the three boroughs that we served, Brooklyn Union was the only option that you had. So while it was important always to treat your customers with respect, and there wasn't the, the competitive aspect of the business. As the energy business became deregulated, it now became important uh, to learn how to operate in a competitive environment. You were not the only game in town, so to speak. People had other options. So you had to really convince your employees who were used to working in a regulated environment uh, that, that it was a different world that we were now in, and you had to continue to be efficient and, and you know, and economical in what you do, but also to provide 
appropriate services to the customer so they would choose you over the competition. And that was, it started actually more in the electric side of the business and then it went to the gas business as well. Uh, and we were a gas company. So it meant we had to work on changing the culture of our employees so that they understood what it meant to operate in a more deregulated environment. Thank you. In the book, The CEO and the Monk, I really felt for you, especially as you went through so many different stages with the different transitions that were occurring. It almost seemed like it was one after the other after the other. And then you basically were tasked with reinventing Brooklyn Union Gas. You mentioned that it was important for you to make Brooklyn Union Gas the premier energy company in the northeastern part of the United States. Can you explain to our audience who your competition was and why this was such a huge endeavor? Well, as we were evolving as a company, you mentioned deregulation was changing uh, the nature of our business. At the same time, we were growing as a company. Uh, we uh, did a merger um, with the Long Island Lighting Company, uh, and that's how Keyspan was eventually formed out of Brooklyn Union. Uh, we also were now getting into the electric generating business. We bought a large generating company, a, generating, a generator in New York City, the Ravenswood plant from Con Edison, and we also, at the same time, were embarking on did eventually acquire gas properties up in New England. So our property are, was now beyond just Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island. We were operating in a number of different territories with competition. So when I was asked about, you know, what was my vision for Brooklyn Union as it was emerging into Keyspan, I said that our goal or vision was to become the premier energy company in the Northeast energy. Obviously, we're now both in gas and electric, so it's all forms of energy. Uh, Premier, to me, meant to be the best at what we did. So we wanted to be the best that we we did in delivering energy to our customers in the Northeast. So that's how that, uh, I guess, tagline, if you want to call it, statement uh, came about. And I wanted our employees to have something that they could focus on. You know, what is our vision for the future? We really want to be the best at what we do in delivering energy to our customers in the Northeast United States. So that's really how that came about. And then we try to tie in the goals of all of our departments uh, into that overall overarching mission of the company so everybody could relate. How did their job tie into somebody in the customer service area? How did their job relate to being that premier energy company in the Northeast? Well, by providing best levels of service to their customers. And that's just one example of how we try to tie all of our employees into that uh, mission or, or vision of the company. Now, you made a part of your team a gentleman named Kenny Moore, who was a former Catholic monk. How did the relationship evolve, and what were some of his strengths that you felt were really critical to this necessary transition? Well, as you mentioned, uh, Kenny had spent actually 15 years uh, as a Catholic monk and uh, decided to leave the order that he was in uh, and um, get into the um, the world of business. Uh, and he uh, was fortunate, uh, we were fortunate enough to hire him at Brooklyn Union in our human resources department. And one of the first jobs that Kenny had was to uh, develop an incentive compensation program in the company. We didn't have any such program in as part of a management philosophy, we wanted to reward people for doing a good job. So at part of that, uh, Kenny had to interview many people in the company, including all the officers. Now, I was not CEO at that time when we first met, uh, and he interviewed me. And I think we kind of connected even at that initial mm-hmm. interview. I saw he was someone who uh, could relate very well with people, uh, knew how to ask questions, the right kind of questions, and, and elicit the right kinds of answers. So that relationship grew, and when I did become CEO, as I was looking at the future of the company and some of the changes that needed to be made and how we could get really closer to our employees, because as you get higher up in the company, one of the things you lose is uh, your contact with with the employees, the people that are doing the job. And Kenny had a really good ability to connect uh, with our employees and and to kind of get a good feeling for what they were thinking about, what was important to them. So I appointed him a corporate ombudsman. Uh, He put it directly to me. And his job was really to 
kind of keep me in touch with what's going on in, as I call it, the real world with the employees so that I could look at what company programs, what philosophy we should have in upper management to really motivate and reward our employees to do a good job so we can move the company forward. So uh, that's where the title, the CEO and the monk, came from. Uh, and Kenny and I worked very closely uh, for many years in working on changing the culture of the company and communicating with our employees. And he did, he really did a phenomenal job reaching out to different employees, what their issues were. But also, I thought it was such a smart move that he asked some of the questions that he did because that feedback really helped you to cultivate the company in the direction that it needed to go in into in order for it to achieve the goals that you had in mind. Well, there's no question. As you get higher up in a company, particularly for the CEO, many people tell you things that they think you want to hear. Uh, and Kenny had the ability to tell me things that I needed to hear uh, and not to sugarcoat anything, and, and but always in a confidential nature. He would never divulge a confidence. And it was important that people knew that while he had the ability to, to report directly to me, that he was not going to divulge confidences. He was not going to come to me and tell me that somebody did something wrong or this was going on. So it was a very important relationship. But yes, he was able to connect with the employees. He was able to communicate with me on a confidential basis so that I could then think about what are the things that we need to be thinking about, what are the things we need to be doing. And he came up with a number of interesting programs that we you know, instituted in the company to help change our culture and get our employees to be feeling that they're part of the team. And I think that was also critical for the company to be able to self-regulate itself, which is extremely important if the company is going to be successful. My next question is, is in regards to a very sticky situation that occurred back in the late 1990s when you basically had to go to Albany to admit a violation to the Public Service Commission. What was that like, and how mortified were you that you had to do this, I mean, especially up in Albany? I can't well, even was, imagine what you, were, what you were experiencing. It was a very difficult situation, but, but I was the CEO of the company, uh, the buck stops here, as mm -hmm. they say. And in my mind, it was always important to be truthful and maintain credibility with people, particularly the regulators and the people that are that are overseeing our operation. So while it was a very difficult situation to have to do, I felt it was the right thing to do and that those regulators and other officials and all they needed to hear it from me. One not to take the blame so much, but to admit that we had made a mistake, that we'd done some things that were wrong, and also to assure them that we were not, it was not going to happen again, and to hear it directly from me. So while it was a difficult instance and a difficult time for me, I think it was the right thing to do, obviously, and it also probably strengthened the credibility that I had with the people in Albany, uh, that, that one, I was the CEO, was willing to come up and kind of take the heat, if you will, but also to assure them that the company was committed to continue to do the right thing going forward. And that you definitely did. I mean, that whole chapter in the book was really amazing. Just reading about the situation that you were faced with and you know, being a CEO is not what people think. It it is a job that requires a lot of strength, a lot of will <laughs> to want to sometimes just get through a crisis, but also to do the right thing that will benefit everybody possibly involved in the situation. And considering the fact that you basically had to confront the folks in Albany and say, hey, look, this is what happened, nobody does that, but you did. Well, thank you. It's nice of you to say that. Uh, I felt it was the right thing to do, and I guess that goes back to my mother's teaching me mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, do the right thing, Bob, and uh, sometimes it's difficult. Being a CEO of a company has a lot of benefits. There's no question about it. Uh, it's, a, you know, obviously a, a position that is, you know, one that people look up to, but it also has responsibilities, and uh, as I said, the buck does stop there. There are a lot of good things that happen as a CEO. You represent the company in many, many wonderful instances, but 
when it's tough times, you've got to be there too. And I think the employees respect an individual that's willing to take the good with the bad or the bad with the good, so to speak. Uh, most of it's good, uh, and it really is, and it's a very nice position to be able to represent a company. But when there's a difficult time, you got to be up to the task also. You can't shirk that. No, it's something that I hope for the folks that are out there listening especially people who are in a position of power, who have responsibilities, not necessarily of this nature, but in other areas, that they look at your example and follow it because that is just such a true test of, or a testimony of what leadership is really about. My next question regards the merger between Wilco and what transpired shortly before Loco and Brooklyn Union came together in regards to a situation with Dr. Catacasinos in regards to his, quote, change of control provision in his contract. That itself, just the whole chapter, something that when you're reading it, all you think to yourself is, how is he going to do this? I, <laughs> all I thought to myself was, my goodness, what would somebody today do if they were in that position? Would they just take the easy road? Would they just do whatever they think would be the quickest solution just to get the heat off their back? That is some situation. Well, it was a, it was a difficult chapter, <laughs> both to live through and, and to write in the book. And there were times when people disappoint you. And uh, uh, I was very disappointed that Dr. Catacasinos hadn't perhaps uh, told me everything that I needed to know as we were going through this transaction. But when it happened, you know, there are a number of things that you think about doing. One is, well, maybe we don't go forward with the deal at all. Uh, two is uh, you go forward and, again, try to do the right thing going forward for all the people that were involved and the time that had been invested by a lot of people. And it was the right thing to do from a company standpoint for the future of our people. So I think that, that was the driving force behind me. Uh, yes, it was a difficult time, but we did get through it. Uh, and um, the company, you know, getting over that hurdle, I think, became very successful uh, in on Long Island in particular and the other territories that we served. So while well, going through it at the time was difficult and it was a disappointment uh, in not being as completely uh, open and, uh, with me as perhaps he should have been, uh, I felt the, the goal of moving the company forward was more important than any personal feelings that I had. Uh, and we did, and we got through it, and it worked out well for our for our company and our people. Thank you. My next question regards a parcel of land that belonged to Wilco that you actually sold to the state of New York. Can you talk about the land and what your first impression was when you first went there? Well, this is the Jamesport property that was a piece of property that the Lilco uh, utility had purchased to build perhaps its second uh, nuclear plant, uh, which, of course, never came to fruition. It was a little over 600 acres, and it was a beautiful piece of property mm -hmm. on the north shore of Long Island. When I went out there, and we thought about selling it to developers to build housing. One gentleman approached me wanted to build a golf course. But went out there, and I stood up on the, on, the, on the little hill and looked at this piece of property and the water. I felt that this is something that had to be preserved for the future, for our children, for our grandchildren. So on that basis, rather than uh, perhaps selling it to a developer and making a lot of money, we did a deal with the state, which actually worked out very fine for us too, but it preserved those beautiful acres forever and in an environmental manner. And again, it was the right thing to do, and it fitted our company's culture of trying to be sensitive to the environment while being a good company. I think the fact that you opted to sell the land to the state and allow the people to really have that land back, so to speak, was something that I hope will be repeated in the future, but unfortunately I don't think that that's going to happen. If it is even an opportunity that happens, that was really something that not many people would do. How do you think that the decisions that you've made as far as being socially responsible and just even towards your employees have helped to create this environment where the employees actually had the sense of job security and could feel good about the place that they worked, as well as the way that the community received the company. 
Well, I think it was all part of it. When we, we came out to Long Island from Brooklyn, we were, really were not very well known. The Long Island Lighting Company employees were under a bit of a cloud, not because they were bad people. These are great employees, but mm. they had the Shoreham nuclear plant cloud over their heads. So we had to do a number of things. We had to, I guess, convince former local employees that we were going to treat them with respect. They were going to become part of the new company. And we also needed to demonstrate to the community that we were a good company, a community-sensitive company, environmental-sensitive company. So any of these kind of acts that could get us some recognition, I think, helped our employees feel good about working for the company. They could be proud to work for a company like eventually it became Keyspan. Uh, and also the community would feel good about Nobody likes to pay their utility bills. <laughs> we don't expect them to love that. But we wanted them to feel that we were a good company and we were on Long Island now to do the right thing and support the Long Island community, and the community responded very well to that. And even some of the other initiatives that Keyspan participated in, can you share with our audience some of these achievements, especially when it came to different issues concerning, for example, the blood that was donated? I thought that that was just amazing. Well, we were obviously a large company, one of the larger employees on Long Island, and there's always a need for blood, and uh, uh, we we encouraged our employees to participate in giving blood, and if they did that, uh, we would give them some time off as a reward. I think our employees would have perhaps responded even if we didn't give them the time off because that's the kind of employees we had. But giving them that incentive uh, just uh, really made our blood drives very, very successful. Uh, we, we were involved in a number of other uh, entities in the community. We were involved in United Way on Long Island. We had a history with United Way in New York, again, giving to an organization that supported the community. And we supported many, many local organizations on Long Island in that manner. And while we didn't have a lot of money to give, we did eventually form a foundation, the Keyspan Foundation, which gave us the ability to do a little more financially supporting organizations, which we felt were the ones that were most important in our community. But I think it all was part of creating an image that we were a company that was responsible to really care about the community that we serve. Thank you. Mr. Cattell, for the folks that are listening out there that may be in a position of leadership, do you have any advice that you'd like to give them? I think the most important advice that I could give them is, as I said, uh, is to uh, have respect for the people that they work with, uh, have respect for the communities that they serve if they are in that type of a business, um, and you know, seek out people that have the same common goals that they do. Try to find people who are competitive. And I always was one who felt you should empower people, give them the responsibility, give them the authority to do their job, and then let them do their job and reward them if they do it well, help them if they don't, if they make some mistakes. But I think that's a key. And, and be very participative in their management style. Listen mm -hmm. to people. Take people's thoughts into consideration. If you're the CEO, eventually you have to make this decision. The buck does stop there. But mm -hmm. I think by making people feel part of the team is very important. Thank you so much. Mr. Cattell, we are out of time, and I just want to say thank you so much for not only coming on the show today, but for writing this book. It was a great journey through not only your career, but also understanding New York's history, and I think that it's such a great book for anyone who either is interested in New York history or is interested in running a business ethically, morally, and with a lot of heart and soul. Well, June, thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time out to speak to me, and uh, I hope that some of these messages resonate with others who have positions of responsibility and authority to help them do a good job. Thank you so much. And folks, the name of the book is The CEO and the Monk, One Company's Journey to Profit and Purpose by Mr. Bob Cattell and co-authored by Kenny Moore. Thank you for tuning in. Have a great afternoon, everyone.